Global Knowledge Forum. Thank you very much. I, uh, I, uh, I'd like to reassure you that they've adjusted the sprinkler system so that this smoke won't set off the, uh, and we don't all get drowned. <laughs> I was wondering what would happen. Well, that was the most spectacular event that I've ever been involved in on a stage. I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed, and thank you for allowing me to participate in this and, uh, and at this wonderful launch. Now, when I, uh, I, I was asked to give this talk, I didn't do enough research to find out who the audience would be, and I was assuming that I was going to talk to educators. So I've actually prepared a talk which is in some ways quite inappropriate, so I'll skip through a lot of it because I understand that uh, most of you are medical professionals and you hardly need the sort of background that it was, I was going to give. I'll tell you a bit about um, what I'm doing with my life currently. Um, I'm still involved in basic biomedical research at two locations. One is at St Jude Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, which is a very major research institute in a somewhat unlikely city. Um, the, one, the group that you see standing in front of the sat statue is the St Jude Group, and the building you can see below is the St Jude Research Building, a very well-funded institution, uh, particularly known for its work on paediatric cancer, but the reason I went there is it has a very large influenza group uh, run by a virologist called Rob Webster, and my interest is in immunity to infections, uh, particularly to influenza. Uh, St Jude is the patron saint of hopeless causes, which, uh, and also immunologists. Um, the uh, other group is at the University of Melbourne in Australia. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, where I now spend the majority of my time, as you can hear from my accent, I am Australian, and, uh, and we're working on a lot of very basic studies of the cellular immune response. Uh, with respect to the Nobel Prizes, uh, this year's Nobel Prize, for the first time, two of the three people recognised by the Medicine Nobel Prize are women, uh, Elizabeth Blackburn and Carol Greider, and Elizabeth Blackburn is a graduate of the University of Melbourne, so we're very proud of her, though uh, as with many great Indian scientists, she spent a lot of her time working in the United States. And of course now we see India emerging so much more quickly as a major scientific nation, we wonder if that, uh, that uh, uh, drain may not even reverse at some stage. Now, apart from doing science, over the last uh, 14 years or so, 13 years since the award of the Nobel Prize, I've also been involved in some senses in science communication. I've recognised just how important it is, is to get the message out there to people in the broader community about the importance of science and about the nature of science. So I've, I've done quite a lot of public communication and also written a couple of books. Uh, the Beginner's Guide to Winning the Nobel Prize, despite the title, which is a bit nauseating in some ways, at least for me, it's, it's basically a book about science and how it's done and, and what it's about and, and, and what science means. And uh, it's, uh, uh, it's meant for a general audience. I even hope that politicians might read it, but that's a pretty faint hope, of course. Um, they, they're generally so busy, in fact, that they rarely read anything beyond short summaries. Um, the other book is my personal exploration of the whole global warming issue, but it ended up being a book on hot air in general, including political hot air and hot air balloons. Uh, so I had a lot of fun with that, but it's a totally disorganised book. The, the Beginner's Guide is, is supposed to be published in India at some time, but I'm not sure whether it's actually, actually been brought out here yet. Now, uh, most of my talk was really... Uh, kind of explanatory about immunity and so forth, and I don't think I need waste your time with that. As we know, uh, immunity comes from the Latin immunus, uh, like uh, religare or religare. Uh, we've, uh, we've borrowed it from the, uh, from the ancient Romans. Um, people who are immunus were either the soldiers who are exempt from certain duties, and they're also exempt from paying certain taxes. Uh, a bit like uh, the view of the world uh, espoused by American Republicans that you don't need to pay tax. And uh, immunity really has evolved to minimise the tax of infection. 
and it's, of course, as we know, it's organised into uh, two sorts of compartments. The innate immune response, which gives us rapid partial protection. It's that first line of defence, which is highly non-specific, has some levels of specificity, and it's the sort of thing we can manipulate by, so, by, by possibly by giving uh, various broad-spectrum chemicals and so forth. And then there's the adaptive immune response, the highly specific immune response, which is peculiar to the vertebrates. And uh, it's about 350 million years old, and of course that's the basis of vaccination. And one of the uh, reasons that uh, I'm out on the public forum is to try and defend vaccination because there's this very strange phenomenon that I think many of you must have encountered where people are rejecting the idea of vaccines. It's up till now been much more common in the countries of the West where people no longer see those terrible, devastating childhood diseases. Uh, we don't see poliomyelitis. People are not accustomed to seeing measles. But this resistance to the idea of vaccination is proving to be extremely dangerous. And if we're talking about education and knowledge, this is one of the things that we have to keep very much in mind. The distrust of the idea of the expert and the need for all of us to be prepared to get back back to basic principles and explain things in a very simple way as we try to bring people on to an understanding of what we talk about when we talk about, say, an immune response and vaccination. It's dangerous to have this situation. We've had deaths in Australia recently from whooping cough. Now, that's absolutely unacceptable, but the anti-vaccination uh, lobby, which is powerful and well-organised uh, and very vocal, has, uh, has convinced a lot of young mothers, for instance, that they don't need to vaccinate their children. They just need to feed them the right food and so forth. Well, if there is a right food that you can be fed, apart from having an adequate diet and uh, not being uh, nutritionally deficient, I certainly don't know what it is after uh, more than 40 years doing immunology research. Research. As we all know, immunity works by protein-protein interactions. Uh, if we look at vaccines, they all work. Uh, the ones we have at the moment all work essentially by the antibody response. They all bind to surface glycoproteins, say, on a virus, prevent the virus infecting. Uh, that structure, the, uh, the thing that looks like a, a lot of ribbons and so forth, is actually the first picture of an antigen uh, based on the first pictures of the antigen-antibody complex of monoclonal antibody in the influenza virus neuraminidase. The red bits describe the binding sites, illustrating that antibodies, the molecules that are circulating in blood and of course circulate for many, many years, are binding to tertiary conformed structures. Uh, that structure is the structure that was used by a chemist, Mark von Itstein, to design the antiviral drug Relenza. So it's one of the very first examples of rational drug design, where you have a structure which is determined from protein-protein interactions, and then you take that and you design a small molecule that will fit into that binding site and uh, inhibit, for instance, the replication of the influenza virus. Relenza, uh, as you know, is, is delivered by a puffer. Uh, the Japanese went ahead and designed uh, Tamiflu, basically very similar, not as good a drug, but it can be taken by, uh, by mouth. But of course that's the way a lot of pharmacology research goes now in the big companies, trying to do rational drug design based on structure. Now, if we think of the vaccines we've got, they all work, those that work against systemic infections where the pathogen doesn't change very much are all pretty useful and good. Uh, that includes measles, it includes uh, polio, both RNA viruses, it includes uh, uh, the new papillomavirus vaccine and so forth. Um, where we have a lot of problems with designing good vaccines, uh, in some situations where uh, the, the, the infection's only in a mucosal surface, though the papillomavirus vaccine is principally, uh, papillomavirus in the cervical cancer is particularly at a mucosal surface, or where we have a systemic infection with something that varies very quickly. And of course, we think of HIV AIDS, we think of hepatitis C virus, 
influenza virus itself varies enormously, but we do get very long-term immunity. Many of us who are over 60 seem to be immune to the new H1N1 swine virus. And it's if people who are very old have antibodies which will cross-react with that. People who lived through the 1918 epidemic seem to have antibodies that cross-react. And that shows you just how long-lived these antibody responses can be. There's lots of research targets, though, when it comes to vaccines. And the real challenge with vaccines for the future for researchers like me is that if we're going to make vaccines against things like HIV AIDS, we're going to have to to do better than nature does. That is, we're going to have to trick the immune system into making a better and more long-term response than would normally occur. And we're hoping that we can do that, but whether we can is really quite a challenge and, uh, and, and it's going to take a lot of work. Um, as you know, uh, viruses are...